working. Hi, everybody. Let me know when you arrive. Say hello. I've had quite a few messages saying, are we on for today? We are definitely on for today. So welcome to E-Thursday. Um, I'm getting myself going here on my phone so I can keep up with all your comments. First one to say hello in the comments section gets 10 points. Okay, we are here and live. Um, okay, Bev, 10 points for you. First one to say hello. Daniel and Marga, nice to see you. Inheritance breakers, eh? Um, yeah, Cassandra, nice to see you. Okay, so this morning, Sharon from Italy, you're taking a break from all your summer weather, going out, eating out and doing all these things that we can't do. Or we can do, but it's winter. If you're living in Veronica Duplessis and Simon and Penny Dunn, nice to see you all. The tribe is arriving. Matthew Mole, nice to see you too again. Louisa, wow. So um, if you live in Cape Town, you will know that we are having a very windy morning. Um, I got woken up early hours of the morning, the wind, and there wind there oh wind. There are wind chimes that I'm hearing that we don't even have. Everything is blowing around and shaking, rattling and rolling. So, um, yeah, so it's nice to see you all arriving. Letitia, Michelle Moore, Moritz van den Heerfer. Hello, nice to see you. Good morning and everybody else. Yeah, what a storm brewing. Apparently there's a very big cold front. They said it's going to slam the Western Cape. So we've got a fire going in the lounge um, and we are going to batten down the hatches and enjoy this winter weather. That's what we do in Cape Town. So I've got a very interesting message for you today. And you know the title is Resurrecting Dreams. So I want to say to you firstly, before we get into it, that these E-Thursdays are not meant for me just to give you a nice message. And then you say, wow, that was nice. And then you go away and you forget about it. Because then there's no purpose. I want to give you something that you're going to receive here. E Thursday on this page, Kathy Mole Ministries. I want to give you something that you're going to receive here that you can take and apply into to your own life. And whatever you're going through, whatever you're trusting God for, um, that it's going to awaken the prophetic inside of you that is sitting there. And by that I mean that you're going to be hearing from God, you're going to be receiving revelation from God, and you're going to be empowered in your walk. And whatever you're facing, I want to say to you today that God is for you. This is something you have to remember right throughout this message, that God is for you. So I want to, you know, they say that thing, don't just give someone a fish, but teach them to fish. I want to teach you to fish. I want to, I want you, and I'm going to share a testimony near the end of this message that really blessed me out of my spiritual socks. But, um, and you all have spiritual socks, you know that. So I want to say, um, I want to teach you how to fish. Okay, so let's get into it. Um, resurrected dreams, that when I say resurrected dreams, we're going to go to a scripture right now. If you've got your Bibles and your notebooks, you're going to be taking notes today. It is 2 Kings chapter 4. <coughs> Sorry, 2 Kings chapter 4, and it's from verse 8. And from verse, the story here starts in verse 8, but I'm, I'm going to give you a backdrop, and I'm going to focus on what happens with this woman. So the backdrop to the story that begins in verse 8 is Elisha passes by this place called Shunem on his travels. And there's a woman in here It tells me there was a notable woman that would persuade him to come to her place and she would give him food. She had a hospitality ministry. She just wanted to bless this guy. And then one day, she, it says she was a notable woman. Um, she persuaded him to eat some food. And then she said to her husband in verse 9, she goes to her husband and she says about this man, she says, I know that this is a holy man of God. And there's another translation that says, I perceive and it's probably old King James, King James Version. 
and I'm reading out of the New King James Version, but this woman says to her husband, I perceive, I discern, or I understand, or uh, there's something about this guy. He's a holy man of God. In other words, he's been set apart by God for a purpose. So I want to do something for this man of God. Um, let's make an upper room. It's not good enough just to bring him in here and give him food when he comes past, and then he goes on his way. Let's make an upper room for him. Let's build an upper room. So every time he comes past you, he can stay with us. She was taking it a step further. And so what happens is her husband agrees with her. They build the upper room. And the prophet Elisha stays here on his travels. Now I want to say to you that at the very beginning of this, that I preached this message many years ago when God spoke to me out of this story. And if you saw my short video yesterday, I think I posted it yesterday or the day before maybe. If you saw that video, I, 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 I said to you, I'm going to speak about one of my favorite stories in the Old Testament. And it's this woman, because I preached this message many years ago, and I thought God had given me all the revelation that, that I could get out of this. And the title of the message back then was Making Room for God. So this is what this woman did. She made room for a person she perceived or recognized as someone who'd been set apart for the purposes of God. And then her reward came. One day um, she was sitting in, she, um, the prophet was sitting in his room and he said to his servant, go and call the woman. And the woman comes up and stands in front of her and he says, you've been so kind to me. What is it that I can do for you to repay you? Now I want to say to you, right as we start this session here, that when you make room for God, when you say to him, God, I've got all these dreams, these desires, um, there, there's some things that I've even forgotten about because it doesn't seem as if it's going to happen. And all you do is you say, God, I'm making room for you. I'm saying, God, it's like Mary said when the angel said, you're going to have a, a child. She said, let your will be done. It, this, is all, this is how we make room for God. We say, God, you're, you're the priority here. Whatever's happening in my life, whatever you've called me to do, whatever I'm praying for, whatever I'm trusting you for, I need to make room for you. I need you in the situation. So this is symbolic of what this woman did um, by making room for the prophet of God. So there's always a reward that comes when you go to God and you say, God, I'm making room for you. I am I'm making a space by faith for you to come in and move. I'm going to give you, I'm going to commit my ways to you so that you can direct my paths. And there is always, always a reward when we make room for God. Instead of doing it ourselves, trying to work it out ourselves, trying to make a plan here and there and everywhere, we say, God, I need you in the situation. So, okay, so that was just the backdrop to the story. The guy, the prophet looks at her, um, she, she doesn't seem to have any need. But now here's one thing you've got to remember from now until the end of this story. He gives her a prophecy. She doesn't seem to see that she has any need because her deepest desire had taken so long to come to pass that she had actually pushed it aside and thought, it's, it's, I'm too past this, I'm too old for this, my husband's too old. She obviously had a desire to have a child, a son in particular, and she didn't have a son because it says, the prophet says to, um, the servant says to the prophet, um, actually, she has no son and her husband is old. In other words, it's too late now. You know, have you ever felt that the things that God has promised you, the storm is affecting Jane's network. Terrible. Let's just pray it doesn't affect this network. So have you ever felt that the things that God has given you to do, um, the purpose that you have in life, the promises that it, he's given you, it's you've passed your sell by date. You know, God has sort of overlooked you and he's moved on to someone else. I want to say to you, your purpose is not over. Your calling is not over. Your, your vision is not over. Because what happens is God takes his desire for your life, even when it comes to a calling to something, you know. It's as simple as this. God, God sees you. He has a dream for your life. He knows the ins and outs, how to get you there, how it's going to happen. And he puts his dream for your life in your heart. And 
you walk with this all the time and the enemy tries to steal that dream that God has deposited in your life. And the reason why it's so easy for some of us to say, I'm going to let this thing go now. It seems to have died. Um, I don't have a calling anymore. It's been too challenging. I can't do this. And the reason that the enemy rides on those things is because what God gives us to do is always bigger than we can do without him. I've said this before many times. God takes delight when you and I need him in difficult situations because only he can handle the calling and the purpose that he's put on your life. That's why he puts his dream in your heart. And we think we're doing this great job of fulfilling our calling and we're reaching people and it's great. But all the time, God has a bigger picture and the enemy gets us to stop right where we are and focus on the challenges. Um, you know, I want to say this, Daniel, I think you saw here, um, unless the storm has taken you away as well, Daniel and Marga, that you guys have had many promises spoken over your lives and you have had many challenges and there, there, there have been so many times where you felt that you had been robbed of things and many times you were robbed of things but I want to say to you today that God is taking those seasons where the enemy came in and stole and he's going to have a better outworking than you thought that you were going to see for both of you as a couple I really see it that God has a very um, he's got a purpose for your lives and the enemy's days of just stepping in and, and shaking things up and then and then you feel as if you flattened and you've got to pick yourself up. Those days are over. It's like God is putting some, he's built some things inside of you. Daniel, he's built some things inside of you. And even though people have disagreed with you and, um, you know, you stood your ground. And God says he's going to show himself strong on your behalf. Okay. Now, that was just a bonus for Daniel and Morgan. Now, let's get into the story. Here's the story. So the prophecy comes to this woman and to the Shunammite woman in 2 Kings chapter 4, if you've just joined in, Debbie Bell, Renee Edwards. Um, so the prophecy comes to this woman, a prophecy that every single one of us would love to receive. But this is important. The prophecy is about this time next year, you shall embrace a son. Now you would think that this woman who once wanted a son at one time, and I'm sure she still did, this day when she stood before the prophet, you would think that she would go hallelujah and run around and do a victory dance, a raise a hallelujah kind of dance, you know. But what came out of her mouth revealed where she was at. And this is where I feel a lot of people are at when it comes to their purpose, their vision, their calling. Not just because we're in lockdown or, yeah, we, we're still in lockdown, but not just because of that, but because of where we are at in this atmosphere in the world. It's compounded like 10,000 maybe more times. It, it feels compounded when you look at your future and you look at the vision that you believe God had for you. So what she says in response to getting this amazing prophetic word is, no, my Lord, don't lie to me. In other words, I, how can this happen? I've waited. I waited for this for too long. My husband's too old now, and this cannot happen. But if you read the story, Later on, go read the story yourself. You will find out that she did have the son. About this time next year, the prophecy came to pass just as Elisha prophesied to her. But now here, our journey begins. And I want my question to you at the start of this journey is, and you'll, you'll, get, you'll understand what I'm saying, what will you do with your 30 miles or more? Okay. If you're taking notes, write that down and you'll understand what I'm getting, where I'm going with this. What would you do with your 30 miles or more on the journey to walking in our purpose, um, receiving a breakthrough, whatever it is, there's a, we're going to take a three part journey and I'm going to show you what happens in our hearts what the enemy is trying to do and what God is doing all the time. And I want to say once again, God is for you. Okay, so this woman has her child, she has the son, and then the theologians have worked this out that the son is about two years old, so she had her promise for two years. Now, some of you, God started something in your life, you saw, you received a great prophetic word, you, God spoke to you personally 
about your future, about where you were going, and you got, you know, all the feelings, all the excitement, all the enthusiasm, all the faith, because you heard from God, and you started to taste a bit of what God said he was going to do. And it looked like your future was made now. Now you're going to be, fame and fortune is yours. You're going to be rolling in the money. You're going to be traveling to the nations. You're going to be doing all of this stuff. And then suddenly something comes in, and it's like this big door closes. Now this is what happens with this woman. Two years later, let's say two years, um, the child is out in the field with his father, and he collapsed. So what happens is they take the child to the mother. He sits on his mother's lap all day and then dies. So what this woman does is she takes the child up to the room that she had prepared for the prophet, the upper room, puts him on the bed and decides she's now going to go and fetch the prophet. Because she knew she had made room for this guy. This guy was the one who had given her this great promise. And remember I said to you, when you make room for God, there's always a reward. I want you to look at Elisha the prophet in this story as the one who gave you the promise that you're still looking at. That you that, that you that maybe you feel that you're too old to pick it up again. Or maybe you feel that you're too old to pick it up at all. It's probably for someone else. And... But there was a time where you made room for God and you said, God, I'll do whatever it is you want me to do. I'll, I'll go wherever you want me to go. I'll give everything away if this is what you want me to do. <coughs> so here she is, sorry. Here she is now with the promise that she had waited for, given up on, and she never asked for it that day. And when the promise came, she said, God, uh, you know, Elisha, don't lie to me now. Do not deceive me. This is, those were the words that she said. And so she takes this promise um, and puts him on the bed of the man of God. Now remember her son has died. And the story, this is the story is her husband hears, she she tells the servants, get get a donkey. I'm just giving you a quick paraphrase out of here because the other things I want to focus on. She tells um, the servant to get a donkey ready. Saddle up the donkeys, we're going on a journey. We're going to go and find the prophet of God. Now, she was in Shunem. The prophet was in at Carmel, which was 15 miles from Shunem. Remember I said, what are you going to do with your 30 miles or more? The prophet was 15 miles away. Now, her husband says to her, where are you going? What are you doing? She says, I'm going to go and find the prophet. He says to her, but why are you going to him today? It's not the new moon. It's not the Sabbath. He was really fishing for answers. And the, she does not say to him, our son has actually died. I need to go and fetch him to, to bring him back to life. She says, all is well. Now, I looked at that. I read it. And I thought, she actually lied to her husband. Because it wasn't all well. Couldn't she have just said, the child that was promised to us is dead. Phone 911, you know, or get the local doctor, or you do something. You know, like, I know when, when something happens in my life, um, in general, around the house here, the first person I call is Rory. Um, whether it's a bug on the wall or something that needs to be fixed, I say, Rory, I need your help. But this woman was obviously one of these independent 2020-style women she, she looked at her husband and she said, all is well. Now, I want to say to you, when the enemy comes to you and looks at you and says, that dream that you've been carrying in your heart for so long, you may as well just give up. Are you prepared to say, all is well? You know, it's okay. I want to say to you, it's easy to say to somebody else. I find this. When, when you're praying for somebody else who's going through a crisis, it's so easy to say, it's going to be okay. Don't worry, because every little thing is going to be uh, all right. You know that song. It's easy to say that to someone else, but when you're in this position and you see the dream that you had, it, it seems to have died on you. The enemy's taken it away. This dream to be this great supporter, financial supporter of people in ministry, and then, and then the devil gets in somehow 
and whips your money out of your bank account and you say, God, where's that promise you gave me? Are you prepared to say, God was the one who originally gave me that purpose. God was the one who put the dream in my heart. It's not my dream. It's God's dream in my heart that I'm carrying. So all is well because he's the one who's going to work this thing out. So this is what this woman did. And she got the, do the, the, the donkeys ready and there she was on her way. I want to tell you a little story quickly. Um, I heard this when I talk about having a dream in your heart. When... I heard the story, um, I heard a pastor preach this, but he was sharing what he heard from somebody else. Now, if you've heard, uh, if you've heard of Dutch Sheets, heard of him, he's an American preacher. I, I've heard of him, but I've never really listened to any of his preaching. I'm gonna go look him up after I heard this, but Dutch Sheets has a friend who is a heart surgeon. I found this so interesting because while I was meditating on this resurrecting our dreams, um, Dutch Sheets has a friend who is a heart surgeon and he was doing heart surgery on a woman. Um, they, they, they completed the surgery. They were all ready to get her up again um, and they could not get her heart to start beating again. They did everything they could. Her heart would just not start beating again. So what this heart surgeon said to Dutch Sheets, this is what he did. He bent over, he spoke into the woman's ear, and he said to her, we need your help. We can't get your heart beating without you. We need you to help us get your heart beating. When he did that, the woman's heart started beating. I want to say to you, the devil is going to make you think your dream has died. But if God has put something in your heart, that thing is never, ever going to die on you. God is never going to give you something, a promise, a purpose, a calling, and let you taste a little bit of it, and then suddenly it's whipped away. Now, I want to say to you, this is where your heart comes into play, and this is where you have to position your heart. Remember, we're going on a 30-mile journey here. Her first 15 miles from the house where her son had died is lying on the bed of the prophet. She's got 15 miles sitting in a donkey cart to get to the one who gave her the promise. What is going? What would have been going on in this woman's head? Would she have been panicking? She just said to her husband, all is well, or it's going to be okay. Don't worry. Every little thing is going to be all right. I wish I could just have a soundtrack that I could press a button and that song, would, you can find the song later. Don't worry. I think it's Bob Marley. I don't know. I'm not a Bob Marley fan. So in, yes, it is. Um, so, so here this woman, she starts on her journey. This is where our first response in a situation, if you feel that you need your dream resurrected, that your calling needs to be resurrected, that, that you've laid something down without even realizing it. You know, for me, this is, I'll tell you what it is, and I'm running ahead of myself. I felt that God said to me, um, a couple of years ago, I really had a desire in my heart. I, I had a passion in my heart to see people get healed. And if you haven't read the testimony of somebody getting healed, go look for it on this page after this video. Um, Letitia Hayes. I asked her to put it in writing after something that happened. So anyway, there was a time where I, I, I saw people get healed because of the faithfulness and the kindness of God. I would pray for somebody, they'd get healed. They'd come back with a doctor's report. It was amazing. And so when it starts happening in your life, when you start operating in your calling or you see the results, you see the fruit, everybody loves you, it's all great. You, you know there's favor on what you're doing. It's easy to be passionate about it. But then over time, I prayed for people and they didn't seem to get healed or no one was giving me feedback. It seemed like all of heaven was quiet in that in that place. And so the other day I felt God said to me, you need to pick that up again. You need to get your heart positioned again to see those things. That was my part of it. Position my heart. And when I made a decision to position my heart, and I'll tell you what positioning your heart is all about now. When I made that decision to position my heart, then the testimonies came looking for me. And so there's a fantastic testimony of Somebody, Letitia, who heard me share a testimony of how God healed me in a dream, she heard the testimony, she took it, 
She went to God and said, God, if you can do that for Kathy, you can heal me. And God healed her. Now, that testimony encouraged me. Then the next day, there was something else that came in. Then I heard something this morning. Somebody else getting healed. So, so when you make a decision to position your heart and you focus on this thing that God had originally intended for you to walk in and to do, and you say, God, my heart is positioned to, to hear from you, you're going to be more aware of the testimonies happening around you that you thought you actually laid this thing down, you laid this desire down, and you miss all the testimonies because you're looking in other areas. Now I want to hear testimonies of people who got healed, delivered, set free, their dreams resurrected, and all of those things. I want to hear those things because we need to hear testimonies. That's something we're going to look at just now. So um, I want to say this: the woman, the, the son that she held in her arms represents your calling, your purpose, your vision. You held something like a baby in your arms and suddenly it felt like it was whipped away. Now what are you doing? You know? So she here she gets on the donkey. They're going on the journey, 15 miles. She's sitting there. You start your journey out so well, you know. We all do, not you, we all do. We start out this journey to our purpose and hearing from God and doing great things with God. And we, it's so easy for us to say all is well because we have this great faith. But on the first 15 miles to get to where the, the originator of the promise is God himself. On the first 15 miles, this is where things begin to happen. Now, I want to give you some, some practical things that you need to do if you feel that the enemy has robbed from you. If you feel that it's too difficult to pick up this promise again. That your calling, your purpose, your ministry, your mission, your passion, it's all just been stolen from you. And it's, it's just chaos. Here's the first thing that you have to do. And it sounds like I'm giving you things to do, but we do have to do some things when we position our heart. Melanie Yester, I thought about you this morning. I meant to send you a message to say, are you going to join in? And here you are. I'm so glad to see you did join in. So 2 Corinthians 4.13 says this. And since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believed and therefore I spoke. We also believe and therefore speak. You've got to be so careful in this, in this, especially in the season of, of not being able to, not feeling as if you're not able to fulfill your passion, your purpose, what God has put in your heart, that we don't speak what the enemy wants us to say over the dream that God has put in our heart. You know, you can't see that thing happening yet. You can't see the victory yet. But we've got to believe that God is for us. Remember I said God is for us. He's not against us. He's not punishing you because things have gone wrong. He's not making you suffer because it doesn't seem to be working out. He's still with you in this thing. He's still for you and there's still a good outcome coming for you. So you start out the beginning of your journey all full of faith. And on this 15 mile journey, this woman sitting in a, in a cart or whatever she was in. I don't know if she was riding a donkey or what, what she was doing. But she knew she still she had a way to go to get to to the prophet. All of the doubts, all of the questions would have would have been hitting her mind like bullets, you know, like arrows being fired at her. All of the doubts. I don't know if you felt this, but I have. When you go through a season of nothing happening, it seems like there's no favor. It seems like people have forgotten you and they moved on to someone else. It seems like everybody else is is being blessed and what about me and I'm praying and nothing's happening and all of the fiery darts of the enemy are just coming it happens to every single one of us but if you're going to position your heart and you're going to believe that God has given you a promise he's, he's said he's called you to something he's given you a purpose he's put a vision in your heart if you're going to position your heart and say God I know that you for me I'm not going to be shaken off this thing that's going to help you on your journey to get to where you're going now so Matthew 6.25 says this. Um, I'm going to read it in the King James Version because um, there's an important thing. Here. Matthew 6.25 and 26, I think. It says, Therefore, I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you eat, what you drink, or what you're going to wear, all of that stuff. And then it says, yeah, it says, Is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment? You know, old King James. But I want you to look at those, that one phrase there, take no thought. What he's actually saying is, don't worry. 
those thoughts that are coming to you today, maybe today God led you here to listen to what I'm saying to you, that your life is over, that your purpose is over, you, everything is going down the drain. Those are thoughts that you must not take. It's an instruction. It's actually a command here. Take no thought. One thought is pointing you in a direction to destruction. One thought, like the fiery dart of the enemy, and nothing is going to work out for you, is, is leading you, is intended to lead you down a path that leads to destruction. This is why Jesus is saying, it's easy to say, don't worry about what you're going to eat or drink or what you're going to wear. It's easy to say that when you have all your needs met, but when you don't have it, and Jesus is saying, don't worry what you're going to eat or drink, and you don't have the money to go and get, buy what you need for your kids, or the money to pay for your rent, or you don't know if your paycheck's going to arrive at the end of the month. It's easy to say, you know, then it's not that easy to say, take no thought. But the reason is, if you're going to take on all those thoughts, those thoughts are going to be your your focus and those thoughts are going to, what, what will be chaining you to your circumstances. And you don't want to be chained to your circumstances. Jesus wants us free, which is why he says, don't even take those thoughts. You know, recognize the thoughts that come. Some people live with this thing that they don't even un believe, they don't even understand that the thoughts that they're battling with are lies of the enemy because God is wanting to get in and speak a better word and speak a better way. So don't take those thoughts. Um, this woman dry, in the car, she would have had all of these thoughts coming to her. Your, she, she saw her dead child lying on the bed. Maybe in your mind's eye, when you're lying in bed at night, you've seen the vision, the great things that you experienced with God. You saw the things that God promised you, and you could see yourself doing it. And now you lie in bed at night, and it's like it's a totally different picture. Don't take those thoughts. Only take what God said. Here's Philippians 4. 6 and 7, and, and I'm going to read it to you in the New, Li New Living Translation, NLT. Yeah. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. This is how you don't take thoughts. Take no thought. When a, worry th a thought of worry comes, you say, I'm not taking that thought. I'm going to pray about it instead. Tell God what you need and thank Him for all He has done. Then you'll experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. That peace is what we need. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as we live in Christ Jesus. So this woman would have had a choice on her 15 miles to get to, to the prophet. She would have sat there and had a choice. Am I going to dwell on the picture of my dead son lying back at home? Or am I going to thank God that he was the one who gave me the promise and he's able to resurrect that promise? This is what we need to be focusing on today. It's not time to compromise. You know what compromise means? To settle for less than originally intended. God did not give you a second-rate purpose. He, he is a God of excellence. He chose you because He knows there's some great stuff that He's put in you. and There's some great stories being developed in your life. There's a great future that He has for you. And so don't compromise and say, okay, I'll just stay here. I don't really need that thing God promised. Yes, you do, or God wouldn't have promised it. So, Matthew 6, 26, yeah, it's the same thing, but now I'm looking, and this is the New King James. He says, look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? I read that scripture in my time of need, when I needed money. And I read that, and I thought, oh, that doesn't make sense, you know. Uh, am I supposed to go and sit outside in the garden and look at the birds and feel better? But the reason that Jesus pointed pointed them to say, look at the birds of the air. Jesus wasn't a hippie. You know, let's go outside and look at the birds of the air and, and drink our tea and we'll have peace. He was not saying that at all. He was saying, the birds of the air, if you observe them, you're going to see there's a reason why they... I mean, maybe birds do worry, but they never tell us because we can't understand them. But the reason is, the, what do birds do? If you observe birds, what do they do? They live a higher life. Birds live higher life to avoid the prey. You, if you watch birds in your garden, even the little pigeons, the doves, they're on the ground, but as soon as you approach, they're gone. They're up there. They live a higher life. 
they live you've got to live a higher life to see your life from God's perspective this is how this is what helps you to take no thought and to replace worry with God's thoughts live a higher life don't live down here in this messy world um, dictated to by your circumstances we've got to live a higher life seeing from God's perspective um, this is how this woman she made room for God when you choose to live a higher life and say God I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to replace the thoughts from the enemy with your thoughts. I'm, you're making room for God. And remember, there's a reward for those who make room for God. Isaiah 54 verse 17. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. There was another thing about the birds. They live a higher life. Yeah. To avoid the prey. Isaiah 54 17. Somebody needs to hear this today. No weapon formed against you shall prosper, and every tongue which rises against you in judgment you shall condemn. It's your job to condemn. Now remember, this woman still, she hasn't got to the prophet yet. She's still on the journey to the prophet to get an answer about why her son lying dead back at home. She's still on the 15-mile journey. Um, the, and then the end of Isaiah 54, 17 says this, This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is from me, says the Lord. And that word heritage means assignment. Assignment. It's our assignment to condemn tongues that have risen up against us. And I'm talking about spiritual things, that lies that come in the spiritual realm, those thoughts that we mustn't take. We, if we take them, we live under those thoughts. If we condemn them, we say to them, in Jesus' name, you have no purpose in my life. You have no place in my life. I take authority over every lie that has risen up against me. And it's, you know, those, those things that rise up against us are accusations in the spiritual realm saying to you, that promise you got from God, you're not worthy to walk in that. Who said you're going to make a difference? Who said you can travel to the nations? These are the things we need to be condemning in the spiritual realm. So, Joel 3.16, remember she's still on her journey to get to the prophet, the, and the story gets better. The Lord thunders and roars from Zion and utters his voice from Jerusalem in judgment of his enemies, and the heavens and the earth tremble and shudder. Did you notice it just got darker in here? But the Lord is a refuge for his people. It wasn't a spiritual thing, it's the weather. Um, but the Lord is a refuge for his people and a stronghold of protection to the children of Israel. When I read that scripture the other day, Joel 3.16, I shared it on Facebook, and so many people liked it, and they said, Amen, and they loved the thing about the lie, the Lord thundering and roaring from Zion. Uh, there are three areas that the Lord, the lion of the tribe of Judah, roars over. If you're taking notes, write these down very quickly. Lynette, if you're late, it doesn't matter, you are here. Um, there's a roar of redemption. Um, the, God is redemptive. Whatever you see in your life today that seems to be messed up, no hope, you're discouraged about, you've given up on, God wants to roar redemption over that thing. He wants to roar his purposes over that thing. And this is, this is what I felt God said to me. I have to read it to you. There's a rising up of a company of powerful prayer warriors and prophetic people. This is what's happening in the spiritual realm now. While people, maybe yourself included, are feeling that our dreams and our purpose and our vision has died. This is what's happening in the spiritual realm if you'll just listen. There's a rising up of a company of powerful prayer warriors and prophetic people. And I know some of you are watching here today with me. Um, to pray and declare God's redemptive purpose where the enemy sowed seeds intended for destruction. What is the enemy sowed in your thinking? Because that thought, if you're going to take it, is intended to destroy you. Prayer that will pull out by the roots and declarations that will plant new seed in freshly turned soil. Isn't that amazing? There's a restoration, raw, to restore faith. God is roaring over you today. To restore your faith in him. He knows when you feel that you can't do it anymore. He knows when you want to give up. So there's a sound that comes from heaven. 
That's what a roar is. There's a sound that comes from heaven to restore your faith in him. You know when somebody does something kind and we say, oh, you restored my faith in humanity. Have you ever said that? So many people say it. You restored my faith in mankind when somebody just does something nice. God wants to roar and show people his kindness to restore our faith again. That he's still alive and well, that he's still moving, and he's roaring a, a restoration roar. Because he wants your faith in him restored. And the other one is um, a resurrection roar. Remember I'm talking about resurrecting dreams. To resurrecting dreams and promises you thought had died. Doubting that you had heard correctly. There's a sound from heaven coming to resurrect those things again. I want to tell you, there are there's revival coming. There's harvest coming. And God doesn't want you scrambling around, you know, searching for things that you thought maybe this was God. He wants to resurrect those, those Ephesians 3.20 things to you that are over and above that you can even dream about in your wildest dreams. 1 Peter 5 verse 7 says, Casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Be sober. Be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. When we take those thoughts, when we take those lines, then the enemy is able to come in and devour. And God doesn't want that. So he says, be sober. Doesn't mean don't drink wine. It means be focused. It doesn't mean, you know, be focused, be alert, be awake. Now here the woman, here the woman, she's done her 15 miles. With all these thoughts coming to her, all of the opposition, all the unknown, you know, that horrible feeling of, it looks like my dream has died, and now we're in the unknown territory. You're in the twilight zone. You don't have a, a, an answer. You just have to go back to where God originally promised you something. She's been this for, in this place for 15 miles, and I'm sure she was trying to convince herself all the way, all will be well. All is well. You know, it's going to be okay. Um... It's going to work out. She would have, you know, that feeling of trying to convince yourself. I'm sure you've done it. If I have, then you have too. But she gets to Elisha. Now, here's the, the, the terrible thing. She gets to the prophet, and you think this guy's a prophet, but he looks at her, and he sees her coming from afar off, and he says to his servant, it's the Shunammite woman. Um, I don't go and find out what's why she's coming to me today. Um, ask her some questions. Is it okay with you? Is it okay with your family? Is it okay with your husband? And he really doesn't know why she's coming to see her. Now, and so, so the, the prophet's servant, Gehazi, says, asks her all these questions. She doesn't tell him, my son has died. She says, all is well. The same, exactly the same as the words that she used with her husband, all is well. When you get, you know, you get to a certain part in your journey and you've been fighting off the lines, you've been confessing the word, and there's a point that this woman would have got to where she gets to him and, you know, you know, we search around for, people, for answers from people, for we contact people and say, I need a prophetic word, well, because we don't know what to do. We don't know which step to take. And all the time God is saying to us, I'm the one who knows the journey that you're on. I'm the one who's walking with you on this thing, and I'm the one who has the answer. I'm the one who's able to resurrect. And so this woman would have got there with a sense of disappointment, because even he even said, if you read it yourself, he even said to his servant, um, she seems to be in great distress, but God has hidden it from me. You know, when you when you get to this place, and you've been praying, and it seems like God's been hidden from you. You know that feeling? Or maybe that's just me. You know, God's hidden. He's, he's, he's gone on holiday and he's, he's not hearing me. My prayers are bouncing. Um, you know, they're, they're hitting the ceiling and bouncing back at me. And I don't know what to do. This is the point where you don't give up. This is the point where you don't take the thought. Because this is the point where your victory is about to, you're going to see the signs of your victory breaking through. So this is where, you know, this is where this woman would have, hoped that Elisha saw her coming, he would have got up and he would have moved towards her and he would have said, God showed me exactly what's happened, let's go. But he doesn't. He waits for her to get to him. You know, God is so gracious in these times where we, the doubts are coming and we say, God, why don't you get up and speak to me? 
you know, where are you in my time of need? And all God wants to do is come to him. And this, this is what the woman does. Let me tell you this first. This is where rejection is going to be speaking loudly and clearly. Rejection, doubt, feeling forsaken. And I'm sure you can relate to this. All of these things. Like, God, I prayed for this for so long. You, I tasted a little bit of the promise that you gave me for, for so long, for two years maybe, maybe longer. And now it's gone. What, what, where have I gone wrong? All of this. And you know, this is where you're going to feel the need to be perfect so that God can answer your prayers. Sometimes perfection, the need to, we overanalyze, and the need to do everything so perfectly so we can please God, is what stops us in our progress. This is the time where we just come to God in vulnerability, and we say to Him, God, I'm so needy. I feel so broken because of what I've been through. I, I, I feel as if I've been robbed of my purpose. I, I, I want to lay it down. I have laid it down, and I can't pick it up again. And look, at this is what happens. Um, and remember, I said God is for you. It's in these times where you're overanalyzing all your emotions and your feelings and your purpose in life that you need to remember God is for you. And if he's for you, he's not going to let you go. So this is when I'm 2 Kings chapter 4 verse 27. She gets to Elijah and she she gets, she says, she it says, she caught him by the feet. You know how many times throughout the Bible how people came to Jesus and they caught him. They, they, they fell down before him. They touched the hem of his garment. They, they knelt down before him. They, they wept before him. This is, this is how this woman would have felt. Because, yeah, she's finally got the person who can resurrect her son. Who can, who can turn around what, where the enemy stepped in to rob her of a promise she had waited so long for. So... She, she caught him by his feet. The servant steps in to push her away, but the man of God said, Let her alone, for her soul is in deep distress, and the Lord has hidden it from me and has not told me. He still didn't know what to do right then. So this is what the woman says. Did I ask a son of my Lord? Did I not say, do not deceive me? It was that statement that got Elisha into action. Um, he remembered that he was the one who gave this woman a promise that was impossible in the natural. Something she had forgotten about. Something she felt that she would have felt she didn't deserve anymore. And back then, two years previous to this day, he was the one who gave her that promise. And this memory got him into action. I want to say to you, when we come to God and we say, God, you promised me this thing. And, you know, when I first, when we first went into ministry, I knew I was called to ministry. I knew, I, from when I was very young, I knew God had a purpose for my life. But when we went into ministry, I didn't know what to do. Rory and myself didn't know how this thing was going to work. We, we had to totally rely on God. There were many times we, um, we had to come to God and sort of fall at his feet and say, God, we can't do this. We need you to step in. We need you to split the Red Sea for us. We're in this difficult situation. We cornered and God stepped in. Um, and so this woman was reminding him of something that he had said, that the prophet had said to her, that she knew was impossible, and he spoke it into being. And if he, if he had spoken something impossible into the natural, he, she knew that this thing could be turned around and he could do it again. And this is what got him into action. Then he said, he said to his servant, you go ahead of her, lay my staff on the face of the child, and, and this happened. So now... But she didn't want the servant to go. She said, she said to him, as the Lord lives and as my soul lives, I will not leave you. She, he heard the determination in her voice. He had said the same words to Elijah when he followed him from place to place because he wanted the double portion of the anointing. And every time he went to a place and Elijah said, stay here because I'm going here. You can read it in 2 Kings, beginning of 2 Kings. He said those very same words to Elijah. As the Lord lives and as my soul lives, I will not leave you. And here he hears the same determination to receive something that he had in his own life. He heard the passion that, that would have been awakened in her life again. And he got up and now the second part of the journey begins. This is what, here she is now, back on the donkey, but with the answer to the problem. 
you know, sometimes we go through this thing and we think uh, we get to this point where we fought off all the arrows, we've prayed all the stuff, and now we know, you know, this is the greatest feeling ever. Now you know you've got God's attention. Now you know all of heaven has risen up and that lion is roaring over your vision and your purpose. There's something that's shifted in the atmosphere. There's something that God is doing that maybe you can't see it, but you just know that God is busy. That's the best feeling ever. That's what I pray for all of you. If you feel that your dreams are resurrected, it's better than actually getting the thing. It's great when God, when the breakthrough comes, but when you know that all of heaven is standing to attention because God, God is busy setting the stage for you to receive the resurrection of those things that you thought had died. God is bigger than the enemy. He's bigger than the than the promises of the enemy, than the threats of the enemy. He's bigger than all of that. He steps into our, our places where we don't have enough faith because he's faithful. He restores our, restores our faith by his acts of kindness. And this is what he wants to do. He wants to show his kindness. So... I'm looking at some of those comments there. I'll go through them all later. So this is what the, what this woman would have been doing on her way. Now here she's got the actual guy. She's got the prophet. Now there's a bit of hope that's arisen in her heart. I, I pray that you have hope rising in your heart as you hear this message today. That it's not all about the hardships. It's not all about the suffering. It's not all about, you know... Oh, you know, the difficult things we go through. It's about living a life of hope audacious hope being audacious enough to have hope that even though we think our dreams have died we've got God on our side we've got the one who gave us that promise right here with us able to roar that resurrection roar over your what you think has died you know some of you you pray for family members and you feel like giving up because it just seems to get worse I want to tell you this is the time to have that passion resurrected to see those things turn around so, Proverbs 16, verse 3 says this, Commit your works to the Lord, and your thoughts will be established. Do you know what it means to commit? Roll away. So what you do, what this woman would have been doing on her f second stage of the 15 miles back, remember they haven't got there yet, her son's still dead. Just because she got hold of God, didn't mean that her son was going to be resurrected back there in the upper room in Shunem. They still had to travel from Carmel to Shunem. And, and this is where a lot of the testing times come. Uh, you, you see God move. Your faith is, you know, awakened a little bit more than it was before on the first half of the journey. Because now you know God is in it with you. But this is where the enemy brings out the bigger guns. And this is where we need to realize God is for you. The bigger guns that come out are not going to take you out because you have God with you in this thing, surrounding you with a shield of favor, um, his power, his anointing, everything he promised you. The, when he gave that first promise, the, the power for the thing to be accomplished is still there. Just because you think it died doesn't mean that there's no power for it to be resurrected. So some of you have had prophetic words spoken over your lives about being called to, to powerful things. Um, to do great things with God and you feel that those things have died I want to tell you they haven't died so um, so commit your works to the Lord roll your those thoughts those lies that come those things that you've done um, those things that you you know that you, you feel you've done and, and nothing has been accomplished by those things that you've done and then you, you roll those things to God. You say, God, I'm giving them to you. But what a lot of us do is we, we give those things to God, but we take them back when the lies come. Give them to God. Leave them there. Let him handle it. Leave them there. So this is, this is one of the ways that you roll those cares, those concerns to God. You commit them to God. You lay them at his feet and you leave them there. This is one of the ways. This is what helps for me. I get testimonies. And they're not only testimonies of things that happen in my life. I want to hear testimonies of things that happen in other people's life to build my faith. Because when the word testimony means to do again, one of the translations. When, so when you hear a testimony of somebody else, like go read the testimony of the healing that happened. Letitia heard my testimony of God healing me in a dream. So she went to God because her faith had been built. 
she was able to go to God and say, God, you did it for Kathy. Now you can do it again, a testimony. So if you're in a position where you, you, you've got God with you on the journey back, but you still need to get that promise resurrected again, you still need to see it up, alive, walking, thriving, flourishing, whatever, the purpose of God in your life, and, and you're still there, there's still a 15-mile journey, what you need to do now is build up a stash of testimonies around you. Get into the Word, read firstly, get the testimonies of people who were delivered. Um, Go read the story of Lazarus, you know, in John 11, somewhere when they're standing before their, uh, the tomb. And, and Jesus says, roll away the stone. And I, don't, I think it was Martha who said, oh, no, please don't, because he's been in there for four days and by now he stinks, you know. And you know what Jesus said to her? All he said to her was, did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? All she had to do was believe, not go into, oh, he stinks. I don't know if this is going to happen. I don't know. You know, this is what we do. All Jesus wanted her to do was believe to see the glory of God. The glory of God is when God steps into your situation and he begins to turn things around and you see those dreams and a passion resurrected in your life. Um, and we've already been going for 55 minutes and I'm almost done. So share those testimonies, you know. Um, when, when I decided to um, build your, 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 like, you know, your ammunition is, oh, the testimony is in your own life, but your ammunition is going to be when you heard that something happened to somebody else as well. And then it's like God inviting you to say, if you can do it for her or for him, you know, I did it for them. I can do it for you too. All you have to do is believe. And you're going to see the stone rolled away and Lazarus resurrected in your life. Um, so when I decided, when I went to God and I said to him, okay, I'm going to, I believe you're leading me this way. I'm going to trace some, um, some testimonies of people that I know got healed. So there was one particular lady in 2016 who came to a ladies meeting. She stood up for prayer and um, she got healed of something to do with a thyroid. And the following week, she had to go to um, she had to go to the specialist to to have all of this checked out. She went to the specialist, and she was fine. It was quite a serious situation. So, in the following week after the meeting, she told me that she'd been healed. So, a couple of nights ago, I thought that I would find this person again just to check up, to check the facts, and so. I, the next morning, I woke up and here was a message in Facebook Messenger from this particular lady. And I thought, I haven't spoken to her for years. We don't talk to each other. Um, you know, I haven't seen her or spoken to her. And here was this message, but this was the scripture that was sitting in Messenger. Luke 1.45, blessed is she who believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. And, you know, when that happened, I thought, okay, God, I'm on the right track here. God, now I know you're leading me to press in for miracles, for healing. And then I checked the story with her, and she said, yeah, that's exactly how it happened. And so, you know, God is putting things in place for you to, to walk in this place of not looking at that dream or that purpose on your life as something that has died. And it's never going to be resurrected again. God is putting People around you who are praying for you that you don't even know about. He's, he's getting, leading people in certain ways. He's speaking to people and setting you up to resurrect that dream in your life again. And I just want to see what else I had here for you. Here's, um, you now the, the end of the story is, um, she was only halfway there when she got to the prophet. And he said, okay, let's go. We're going to go back. And then they get back to her son, and the prophet Elisha goes up to her dead vision. I want to say her dead vision, her dead promise, um, that thing she, you know, that, that seemed to have been ripped away from her. And he goes and he puts his hands on his hands, his mouth on his mouth, and his eyes on his eyes. And there's a whole lot of insight and revelation into those three things that he did, but I won't get into you now. I'll save it for another time. And so I want to say to you that if you are prepared to go to God with what you feel 
the devil has stolen from you. Um, with an area that the enemy keeps on saying to you, this is never going to turn around. It's just going to get worse. You know, you're never going to get healed of a thing that happened to you. You're going to end up in, in hospital and it's just going to go from bad to worse. Um, this morning I heard a great, I read a great testimony of somebody who got healed. Uh, it looked like it was the coronavirus symptoms that were manifesting and her child prayed for her and she got healed. And God spoke to the child, gave, gave her daughter a picture of, of what he was doing. I want to tell you, it is possible for God to do what, what the enemy is saying to us. It's impossible. God is releasing that roar of resurrection over your life today, right now. I really believe it. So, um, so uh, here's, here's another encouragement for you. You know when Joseph was sent to Egypt, sold as a slave, went to prison, ended up in Egypt. Jacob, his father, he was Jacob's favorite son. He was the he made his son the coat of many colors, which represented the favor of the father, the favor in in the father's household. But Jacob thought that his son had died. So for all those years, he carried this grief in his heart that that his favorite son no longer existed. And then one day he was re reunited with his son, but not only with his son, he met his son's sons. God always does more than we can ask or think or even request in our wildest dreams. You know, he didn't, it, wasn't, it wasn't enough just for, for God to say, okay, Jacob, you waited all this time, here's your son. He met his descendants, he met his, his grandsons. I want to encourage you today and say, Firstly, thank you for sticking out with me for an hour here. But I want to encourage you today that God is in the business of resurrecting. When the enemy um, is doing, is, is shutting down, when the enemy is barraging us, with, is that the right word? Sending a barrage of lies our ways, that nothing is going to happen, that it's just terrible in your life, that God is doing the opposite. So we're going to be prepared to live that higher life. Observe the birds, you know, maybe on a nice day, it's raining right now in Cape Town. If you're living in one of those countries, like I saw um, Renelle in Germany, Rita in Holland, Sharon in Italy, if you anywhere else though, where it's not raining and it's cold, and you can go and sit somewhere, go and observe the birds. And you're going to notice they live a higher life. They, 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 they live from a, high, a different perspective to avoid the prey. That's why they do it. So if we're going to be willing to, to live this life from, a, from God's perspective, that we're going to commit all our cares to Him and leave them at His feet because He's big enough to deal with those things. He's big enough to, you know, to help us. And then remember, our assignment, it's not just something we've inherited. Isaiah 50, what did I say? It was 54. Uh, or 59, um, our assignment, no weapon formed against you shall prosper, Isaiah 59, um, our assignment is to condemn those lies that are trying to keep us down, trying to make us think we're never going to reap the benefits of our prayers, we're never going to see God step in to our situation, so please be encouraged today, um, trust God to maybe that dream that you've had, maybe you, you had a dream. I, I feel, I want to say this as I end off, there's some people who are watching now that you had a dream that God put in your heart that for your family, to see your family serving God together, to see your family, you know, flourishing in, in the purposes of God, that you've got a son. I don't know who you are. I can't say who you are. But there's somebody here watching me here with a son who's got a calling on his life. And his life just seems to be going in the opposite direction. And you've been praying into this, trusting God for this. And God wants to resurrect that again in your life. He wants to bring restoration here. If you missed the part in this message where I spoke about the three areas that the lion roars over, you can backtrack somewhere. You can think, think about, uh, find it again. Those three areas that God is wanting to resurrect those dreams that you have for your family. And that you're going to see it happen. Don't give up now. Just because it looks like... God has given up. Don't give up. The, this message today is to encourage you to get up and say, God, I'm making room for you now. Come step in here. And he's going to 
show you some amazing things. Um, so I pray that the lion of the tribe of Judah will be heard in your life. And when you get into bed tonight, it won't be the sound of the lies. It will be the sound of the roar of resurrection that God's about to do some great things for you. So thank you for joining me today again. I love these Thursday sessions. I don't want to go now. We've gone over an hour already. Um, I just want to say um, that, you know, last, I think it was last Thursday when, when I asked you to, to pray for people, um, to pray for people. Remember, I gave you two names and you, and was it last Thursday? The, the weeks just seemed to go, move so quickly. Um, that, and we're going to do that again, that there are more people who are asking for prayer and we're going to do that again. And I would like to get you all involved, get your gifts flowing, because those words that were coming were really great. Now, I want to say something very quickly. Michelle Patain Moore. Um, I, I really feel God's got a great purpose for you, that there's a ministry that God's been developing in your life. I don't know if you're um, operating in it already. I hope you're still here. If not, um, let me know if you're still here. Michelle Moore that there is a purpose that God has. You've got an amazing ministry to women, um, that God wants to, to use you to encourage women to build their faith and, and to teach the Word of God to women. And there's also a prophetic edge to your ministry, that the enemy's been lying to you and saying that you don't really hear from God, and you know, you, you don't have the goods to give. And I just want to encourage you today that God is really busy with you. And Denise Jones, so nice to see you all the way from Toowoomba. Beatrice Boyson, Lo, I'm so glad this was what you needed to hear today. It's such a pleasure. Um, when God begins, Louisa, are you still here? I want to say something to you, Louisa. Okay, Michelle, you're still here. Louisa Huff, just put in the comment here, I've got something I want to say to you. But when, when God's people get together and, and we encourage each other, it's the best thing. Louisa Huth, I'm going to say this anyway. Louisa Huth, um, there is an anointing in the area of intercession. And you've seen things. You have, okay, Nathan, I remember you, Jess. Um, Louisa, God has shown you some amazing things. Um, and you're going to see even more. I just feel God's, God's setting you up um, to have an encounter with Him because. You've seen up until a certain point, you've got this passion to see people set free. Louisa Huth, I'm hoping you're going to pop in here and tell me that you're still here. Um, okay, I see some people are giving other people words. That's great. Keep it up, yeah? Um, but Louisa, that God is going to use you in an amazing way, that he's going to show you even more um, and like insight into the word and insight into things that like discerning what God is doing in the season. So yeah, so um, Deirdre, it was nice to see you too. And I think we need to go now. Eh? It's really raining in Cape Town. I wish you were all here so you could come and enjoy my um, the fire that we've got here. And Rory's making us lunch. Yeah, so, okay. I'm going to say goodbye. I'm going to let you go. Thank you so much for sharing your time and your data with me. And I'll see you again. Um, as soon as as soon as possible, if not next Thursday, I will definitely next Thursday. But if not before, I will let you know. So I see we've had a lot of new people joining in today, and people were sharing the link and all of that stuff. So make sure you keep watching the page, Kathy Mill Ministries. Well, that's where you are now, and then you will see when um, I'm going live again. So have a fantastic Thursday. Yeah, uh, okay, yeah, that was 10 minutes ago. I let, I'll, you can what, read the comments. There's some um, comments coming in there. People have testimonies. Please put your testimonies in there um, of what God has done for you. And then um, I can share them and just help people to build up their, you know, their weaponry with testimonies, even if it's from other people. It builds our faith, and this is what we need in this season. So I'm going to say goodbye. I love you lots, and I'll see you soon.